Falando. Morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to this Great Lakes Rota RC presentation. Today's webinar is Changing Families, Changing Outcomes, Compassionate Responses to Substance Use in the Family. This webinar is being hosted by Great Lakes Rota RC's regional partners, the uh, University of Minnesota Extension and UW-Madison Division of Extension. I'll be your host, Lauren Doyle. I'm a program assistant for the Great Lakes Rota RC. And before we get into our presentation, we have a few quick housekeeping items to address. So first, let us take a moment to acknowledge our funder and funding activity. The Great Lakes Rota RC is funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration to provide training and technical assistance to the rural communities within the Great Lakes. Collaboratively, we develop and strengthen community capacity to prevent, treat, and support recovery for opioid use disorder and other mental health conditions and substance use disorders. Through cooperative extension state programs, we employ evidence-based emerging practices and provide virtual and or on-demand education for rural community members regarding substance use education and other relevant topics in mental health and substance use disorders. In communities with indigenous populations, the project co-creates holistically responsive uh, or culturally responsive holistic health education and resources. We also provide evidence-based resources and research, as well as technical outreach to professionals working in and with rural communities. We invite you to learn more uh, about the Great Lakes Rota Rural Opioid Technical Assistance Regional Center, its resources and partners by participating in our grant products, which we'll show you a couple of. This is uh, an example of what we have on our website. We offer virtual education, newsletter articles, technical assistance, toolkits, news and updates, and funding announcements. And we'll drop the link to the website in the chat. And then we also invite and encourage you to join our e-newsletter distribution. Once a month, we provide regional content as well as national resources. And every other week, we also provide available training updates hosted by Great Lakes Rota RC partners, as well as regional and national professional development opportunities. As we prepare to listen and engage in the session content, let us take a moment to promote the use of affirming person-first language when discussing behavioral health disorders. As we create an environment of learning together, let us create a space a learning space that is welcoming and safe for everyone. As a virtual learning community, we ask that all participants support non-stigmatizing recovery-oriented language that can help reduce negative bias and promote engagement. We invite your active participation from whatever space you are joining us today, and we welcome you formally into the Great Lakes Rota RC virtual learning community. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Pam Lanhart is the founder of Thrive Family Recovery Resources, a Minnesota nonprofit recovery community organization created specifically to support family members impacted by their loved one's substance use. Pam is a certified family recovery coach and a certified peer recovery specialist. Pam ser serves on the Minnesota Governor's Advisory Council for Substance Use and is passionate about assisting families to respond to substance use with, to use with compassion, empathy, and kindness based on evidence-based best practices. And with that, I'm gonna hand this over to Pam. Thank you for that introduction, Lauren. And um, I just wanna thank you for inviting me here today. I appreciate having this opportunity. Anytime I can have the opportunity to uh, help professionals, educators, individuals respond to substance use in the family in a way that is evidence-based and compassionate. It is, that is why I do this work. I am so passionate about that. So again, thank you for inviting me here and um, thank you for um, attending. For those of you who, who are attending today and taking your morning, we only have an hour. Um, and you know when you're when you're passionate about something, you could talk for days. So uh, I'm gonna try to fit as much as I can into this hour. But just know that this is a series. We have three Tuesdays that we're gonna be spending together. So I hope that you can make it to the rest of the series. Um, you also should have received some worksheets, and I love to do interactive work. I love doing workshops. I run some family programs at 
treatment centers. And so I always like things to be at least a little bit interactive with only an hour. We might not be able to do as much as we can. But in every instance, we're going to have some thought provoking questions and there's going to be some work that you can do if you want to to take back with you. And then we might have a few minutes for Q&A at the end. Um, so with that, I'm going to just go ahead and um, get going. And some of this data is data that you're already aware of, but according to the latest statistics from the CDC, 40.6 million people um, suffer from some sort of problematic substance misuse. And uh, I think these days it's recognized as a spectrum that, you know, we have people on the very uh, uh, front end of this, children that might be using marijuana, um, all the way to people that are uh, really um, consumed by the opioid epidemic. And, and so there's, you know, there's a large space between all and nothing. As a peer support specialist, we don't diagnose. Um, so I, I might use substance use disorder, but we don't really use that language very much in the work that we do because as a family member or as a peer, that's not my work. Um, ethically, but we know that 40.6, 40 so if you do that math, 335 million people in the United States, general population, and, and for every one person that is struggling with substance use, there are, you know, a minimum of two to three to four family members that are impacted. So again, that's a third of our population. I always say if you just, you know, go to a soccer game and you look down the, the row of attendees, you have one in three people that has been impacted. And I, I think we're in a culture where almost everyone knows someone who has lost a loved one or who is impacted. Um, and, you know, we know that the attention right now is primarily opioid use disorder, but in, uh, in Minnesota, the data supports that in rural communities, that can also look like methamphetamine use or alcohol use. Um, now, what we do know is that 23, over 23 million people are in recovery and um, that that means that recovery happens, people are activating recovery every single day. And um, how that impacts the family, one of the things that I believe strongly in is actually not pathologizing addiction, in the family. So we talk about um, addiction as a family disease. That's some language that's out there or it's been out there for the last 80 years. And I think that family members adapt. We're creatures of adaptation. I don't even think it's maladaptive. I think that um, when a family member has a disease and I just, I my mother has dementia, my daughter has brain cancer, my husband was just diagnosed with prostate cancer. So, you know, we adapt to that because we have natural instincts for survival. And so what we know as family members is that one family member that moves towards change. And if you want to call it recovery, you can. I like to even think about uh a move towards health and well-being. The word recovery and, and as defined means, you know, reclaiming something that was lost or a return to health and well-being. So if even one family member starts to change um, the, the way that they're adapting to substance use or mental illness in their family, it can actually help create an entire family recovery ecosystem. And that's the language that we're using in our work here in Minnesota is that we want to create, we talk about ecosystems, right? Recovery oriented workplaces, recovery oriented communities. And as family members, we have the power to create recovery oriented families. I don't believe that we are powerless. I think that we have a lot of ability to, you know, change the way that we're adapting and create this healthy family. We see this with the social determinants of health. Why do families matter? And um, and there's a, a statistic back here that says one family member has the impact of five clinicians, which is kind of pulled out of this social determinants of health, right? That the clinical care is only 10%, but when, and biology is 10%, but when we look at all these other factors that go into play about how people get well and how they live healthy lives, social and economic factors, health, ideology, and behaviors, 
physical environment, all of these things, we just had a conversation last night in our book club, right? Is it um, nurture or nature? You know, when we say things run in the family, is it DNA or is it actually family patterns? And uh, one of the work, one of the things that we do when we work with families is really look at some of those family patterns that happen. We were just talking about mending broken hearts and how trauma is passed down. You know, trauma isn't in our DNA, right? Trauma is something that happens to us. It's not intrinsic in us. And we pass trauma from generation to generation. One of the things I love to do is work with families in looking at their genograms and how trauma has impacted some of the patterns in their families. And just so you know, contextually, I'm going to be talking a lot about how we work with families. Everybody does things a little bit different. So, you know, this is our process. Um, and it, uh, last year we were, we, we worked with, we engaged 57 new families in one-on-one -on -one peer support with just two part-time staff. And the data was that 50% at the end of the year have reported that they've moved, um, that their loved one actually has engaged in some sort of uh, recovery activity, uh, moving towards health and well-being. Sometimes I use that word more than recovery in the sense that for some individuals who are really struggling, the word recovery feels hard, but you know, a movement towards health doesn't feel quite so threatening or quite so all or nothing for some people. And you know, we talk about why families matter. Um, and uh, for those of you who have worked in the field and you've done this work, you know this to be innately true, but they, they have the most to gain when the family member gets gets healthy. And I think about, again, my mom with dementia and how without our help and support, she would never get well. She would not, well, let me just put it this way. She's, she's, she's chronic, but her life would not be the way it is right now with our, without our support. And so families member, because we, we passed down our um, health behaviors, our health patterns. Um, when I sat with my mom, they asked me what her symptoms were. So we have a better idea of symptoms. We know that in mental health, and we have many families going through this right now where, uh, you know, they maybe have stopped taking their meds and they don't even know that they're experiencing the symptoms of their um, mental illness. And uh, we also know that we have the most to gain. I want to have relationship with my loved one. And so all the work that we do here and that we're going to be talking about over the next three weeks is about relationship. Um, why, is, why is that important? When I work with families, they come to me because they want to be in relationship with their loved one. That's their, that's their heart. That's their goal. And we've had so many uh, individuals who are in recovery report that it was those relationships with their families that kept them alive every day and motivated them towards change. And so to separate or try to segregate or detach or disconnect the family is really working against nature. You know, we naturally have these connections and they can be leveraged for good when a family really starts to move towards their own health and well-being. And then also there's an idea in this work that you can't change anyone until they're ready to change. And in our practices, we use the evidence-based uh, motivational interviewing modalities, and we really help families learn those tools and skills that can either shut down change or create an environment that will help someone change. So we really think that um, we the average length of use is 10 years. That's That was data that was um, based on NIDA research and that was back a couple of years ago that that came out. But 10 years of active use, um, that's a long time. And the work of these evidence-based practices like motivational interviewing and craft um, can actually have been researched to, to shorten that length of use. So the, the things that we're going to be discussing today and, and through the next three weeks are things that we can do.
practices that we can engage in so that we can become safe people and better humans. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about what it means to be safe in a minute. And we think the very first thing in order to create a safe space is person first language. For many of you, your professionals, you know this, like this is part of your daily work to convince a family member that we want to stop using the words addict or alcoholic is one of the toughest things that I have to do when I start working with a family. And we know that words have power. We know that language matters. And challenging that paradigm is difficult. Um, well, they are. They are an addict. They are an alcoholic. So a couple ways that we do this in our work is um, to model that. In our work, we don't use those terms. And in fact, in our evidence-based support groups, which we run um, 19 evidence-based support groups every week, uh, both in person and virtually, that's part of our group guidelines. And, and when families ask, well, they are addicts, right? That, that's what they are. And, um, you know, what we try to explain to people is that, that that language is used to dehumanize, that we create power differentials when we call people by their diseases or diagnoses, and we don't do it in any other medical model. And if, you know, we have families that kind of live this dichotomy where they want their loved one to get medical help and get treatment, but then when it comes to how they do that, um, they might be used to hearing uh, language and hearing phrases that are not at all informed by evidence-based practices, things like rock bottom or tough love or, you know, detachment. They're not informed by research. And uh, so we try to uh, encourage family members, first of all, to think about how they've been uh, interacting with their loved one and if they have created a power differential, us versus them, those people. Um, and we know that we do that to protect ourselves, right? I, you know, one of the beautiful things about the curriculum we use, Invitation to Change, is it's always the two sides to the coin, the yes and. So it is yes and. And yes, this is so painful. This is so hard. And you're here because you love your person. When you love someone um, and they're suffering, it is incredibly painful. So I put up shields to protect myself. And, and sometimes I adopt behaviors that protect myself, which could be unsafe for another person when it comes to relationships. Um, and we think that healing happens in safe places. So we're going to talk for a minute. And again, some of these exercises are really things that I would do with a family member. Um, and we have some worksheets that you guys have uh, been able to uh, get ahead of time. So let's talk about like what makes someone feel safe, right? And this is language that is really common in the work that we do. I think Brene Brown has done a really good job of bringing some of this language of empathy and compassion and safety into the work that we do. And also, I think a lot came out of the uh, uh, COVID 2020 and, the, and even before that, the Me Too movement. Um, but holding space for another person. And, and what does that look like? It means that we're willing to just walk alongside them. I love the book, The Anatomy of Peace. And one of the stories in there talks about a therapist who had a, a participant who ran and she ran so quickly and she took off so fast she lost her shoes. And the parent was like, well, what did you do? You know, did you make sure that she had shoes? And the therapist said, nope, we, we took off our shoes and ran alongside them. And that's what it means to hold space for people is we're taking off our shoes and running alongside of you. I'm on the same path. I'm holding space for you. I might be, you know, physically holding you, but it we cannot do that unless we let go of judgment. And in the work of families, it is difficult to not 
be in a place of judgment. And especially if we are people that have never suffered with substance use, I will always say I'm not in the same boat, but I am in the same ocean. And so I, you're right when families say, but you don't know how it is. You're right. I don't know how it is for you. I do know that I understand pain and suffering. Uh, and um, I think that helps us come at this from a place of empathy, which is a core of motivational interviewing. And I am just going back to, you know, how we think about someone really turns into how we treat them and helping families to really think about how I am in my way of being towards others. So when we start, we really want to acknowledge and validate where family members are at currently. And I, I, uh, we are actionable, solutions-oriented, you know, a, an organization that really likes to provide um, actionable solutions, skills, and tools. But really, before we do any of that, we have to hold space for our families when we're working with families. Um, where are you at now? And um, so just thinking about that, uh, you know, what, what roles we can take when our family is in chaos. And um, again, it's always a, a yes and our natural instinct, acknowledging our natural instinct to step in and to take action. Um, and uh, so my question is, where are you at right now in your relationship with their loved one? If they're not in recovery, oftentimes a family member will recognize themselves in some of these roles. This is an evidence-based, you know, the Cartman drama triangle. Um, we can take on roles when we're in trauma and when we're in pain. Um, I think about uh, the, the phrase that says um, busyness is a trauma response. Overachieving is a trauma response. So of course, substance use is very trauma producing. Um, that is just a given. Now, family members might not say that it is trauma, um, but if you find out your 13 year old is alarmingly addicted to fentanyl, that's trauma. And our natural instinct is to step into what Cartman's uh, evidence suggests is one of three roles, right? We want to rescue. And of course we want to rescue. You think about the data and the statistics. And, you know, just yesterday I found that another mother has lost her son to an overdose. And in this work, of course, I hear this all the time, um, <clears throat> that almost probably once a week, someone that I know uh, has lost their loved one and we see the news and we see the data and we see the statistics. And so validating that these roles are natural, you know, we, we might want to step into the rescuer role. And that's a role in grief as well. And there's so much grief in um, substance use. I, I will share at full disclosure our son had four years in recovery and had a, a day and we lost him to an overdose in 2021. And therefore I can relate to every single one of these roles that we can fall into being a rescuer, you know, which is sometimes I want to rescue my family. How are you doing? Checking in with them. You know, I wanna rescue the people that are suffering. I want to, sometimes I have to, if you're doing this work and you're a professional, we have to be careful not to let our own trauma end up wanting to, you know, rescue other family members, right? They have to sort of experience their own journey. So we want to jump in and shortchange this for people, but these are natural roles. So I want, I want to feel needed. I have family members that continue to stay in the same patterns um, that might not be incredibly healthy because it helps them feel needed. 
I mentioned the book, The Anatomy of Peace, and he talks about these boxes that we end up in um, because we uh, have these, you know, needs, right? And, and a need to be seen and heard and needed, those are natural needs. So one of the first things we can do is step into uh, some unhealthy behaviors that appear very self-sacrificing because we need to feel needed or we might feel like um, we are the only ones in, their, in our loved one's life that can really help in these situations. And there are certain instances where you know, I have a mom that I work with that her son is very, very chronically, he has schizoaffective disorder that is medication resistant. Um, he is chronically mentally ill and, you know, he would not be alive right now if it weren't for her. So there's always a balance in these roles. Um, the second one is we can fall into a sort of the victim mentality. And I, I was there when my son was 13 or 14 and I was sitting in rooms where, you know, the greatest worry that some of my friends has was whether their kids were going to get into AP calculus. And I was like, I don't know whether my son is going to live. And this was when he was just young. And so we we can, um, in many ways, we are a victim of substance use. Like, this is hard. This can ravage a family. <clears throat> and, um, that's where, again, yes, and comes into play. We can fall into um, helplessness and we can fall into um, severe blame or shame. And we're going to talk about shame statements later. Um, we can over manipulate. Um, I would, I was, I can't, I mean, honestly, and I, this is why peers are so effective. Like, I ran interference for my son so many times when he was a teenager and I thought the only thing that was good in his life was keeping him in certain athletic activities and I would advocate for him even when probably the best natural consequence for him may have been to, you know, remove him from the team. Um, and, and so I wanted to manipulate his environment and my environment, and we can fall into that role. And then um, the what happens is, is if we sit in um, that place of being a victim for too long or a rescuer, then we end up wounding other people, right? So the prosecutor role, the wounded become the wounders. We know that to be true in trauma. Oftentimes, as someone who was a victim of serious trauma, we can end up, if we don't heal it, we pass it on, right? And so whatever trauma we've experienced ends up being held in our body. And the release of that often is in overaggressive behaviors, over judgmental behaviors, maybe um, being a uh, bullying, you know, being a bully, becoming a bully. So I think that very trepidatiously introducing some of these roles in that yes and um, ideology. Like we, we are in pain and acknowledging that pain is so important. And we can, in that pain, end up in, our, in, in an adaptive behavior that might not be serving our family or our own lives in the best way possible. Um, so uh, just thinking about uh, these questions, and we have a worksheet that talks about our behaviors as family members and why our behaviors make sense. Okay, so, you know, these behaviors that we talk about are, are make it stop behaviors. We talk in substance use about behaviors making sense, and I'm going to get into that a little bit deeper later, but you know, the problem isn't the substances, the substances are the solution, right? Um, the, the, the manipulation or the control uh, isn't the problem, that's the solution. When I feel activated or I'm in a trauma response or I feel disconnected from the people in my life that I love the most, I can um, 
perhaps fall into one of these roles and I feel better, right? In our family, my go-to behavior, and I didn't even know this at the time, that, you know, my parents struggled with substance use issues. Um, my dad died from his, uh, the effects of his alcohol use. And so when my son was using substances, my make it stop behaviors were control manipulation and yelling. If I didn't get what I want, I could just talk louder and then I would feel more heard. Even though in the immediate, it worked well for me in the long run, it ruined my relationships. So the question here, and we have a worksheet, if you guys wanna pull out that, um, that worksheet, you know, what, what, where are you at right now? If you are a family member watching this, listening to this, and what are some of your typical make it stop behaviors? And if you wanna throw that in the chat box to make this a little interactive, you certainly can. But then the question becomes, are your relationships with others where you want them to be? And how are these behaviors impacting your relationships? So we have uh, most of our families report that not only uh, is my relationship fractured with my person who is struggling or suffering, but it's also fractured with my other relationships. So you know, my partner, my husband, my wife, my other children. Um, one of the things that we just recently did was started a sibling group. And siblings often report that the reason they feel resentful in their relationships is because the attention of the mother or father has been so focused on the sibling that suffers. And, and so there's, so there's, again, that that trauma ends up being passed on because uh, the needs of the family system are not being met because the addiction is in the center of the family. And that is the focus. So thinking in terms of your own relationships um, that you have, where are you at in those relationships? And what would you really like to um, see happen in those relationships? And, you know, just a really quick, uh, Sheila, I like your question. Um, there's some data that the Minnesota Department of Human Services put out because, of course, we support multiple pathways and we have to validate and acknowledge that the 12 steps in recovery has been extraordinarily helpful. And the data suggests that prior to activation of recovery, uh, language like addict and alcoholic causes harm and prevents people from activating recovery. I get a lot of uh, individuals that call me and, you know, they, if I use the word, you know, and I don't use it anymore, but if they hear the word addict or even the word recovery or 12 steps, they bristle. But if we talk about it in a way that's like, this is a health issue and you have, you know, a, a health related illness, usually they're much more amiable to getting help. And then moving into the 12 steps, we know that there's, there's you know, ideology around that that can be very helpful, which is that in the rooms, I am not a doctor, a lawyer, a janitor, a pastor, I am an addict. And so, you know, just looking at the family work that we do, we really, we're like, we don't go there. Um, if an individual wants to self-identify in any way, they can do that because that is, you know, that is um, necessary in our culture for diversity, equity, and inclusion as well, right? That I self-determine um, and you get to do that and um, I don't get to do that for you. So I just want to men mention that question. Thank you for, for bringing that up. So... Um, Looking at that workshop worksheet, what are your make it stop, stop behaviors? And acknowledging and validating that we have them is the first step to moving into creating a safe environment. And you know, we talk about um, safety. So this is the worksheet, our behaviors make sense. And if you wanna take that back and do a little work on that, when I open up next week, I'm gonna ask you about your homework, okay? Um, but, but when we look at our behaviors and why they make sense, we have to acknowledge 
trauma in the brain, right? And we know that trauma affects the vagus nerve. It activates um, the, the amygdala and the parts of our brain that go, the, the limbic system that creates survival. So oftentimes these behaviors that make sense are rooted in survival, right? And so explain to a family member that in many ways, their behavior is absolutely normal because when you are in a constant state of trauma, your vagus nerve is activated, your uh, limbic system is activated, your, your uh, brain is producing biochemicals that make you hyperreactive, right? And, and uh, then what happens with that is the prefrontal cortex goes offline. And so we can't be safe for other people unless we are in our rational brain. And, and this kind of comes out of like dialectical behavioral therapy, wise mindedness. Um, you know, you budget. can. Okay, hold so on. So I did no. their budget template, which gives you. Okay, sorry about that. Um, but uh, again, validating how are we experiencing the trauma in this relationship? Right. And when we look at fight, flight, freeze, fawn, and those trauma responses, they almost all kind of relate back to the drama triangle. So working with a family to really think about like, what are your trauma? How are you experiencing trauma right now? I can't be safe for somebody else until I am safe in my environment. Um, in fact, one of the four pillars of recovery is um, safe and stable housing. So getting your family member, or if you are a family member, thinking about what does this trauma in my family look like? Now, we're going to talk about mitigating trauma later and boundaries and, and things like that. But uh, for now, we're, we're really just, I want to validate and acknowledge and think about like, what is your typical trauma response? And that is your make it stop behavior. Um, some people fight. I used to say I was a dump and run kind of girl. You know, when I felt activated, I would just verbally kind of throw up on people around me and then I would do a mic drop. I wasn't interested in listening. I wasn't interested. I, I, I hadn't, I didn't have that model. The other way that I um did experience my trauma response was to be busy right to just get busy which is kind of a flight response like if I just wouldn't do stuff um so thinking in terms of an acknowledge acknowledging um trauma so then when we do that the first thing we do with a family is get them back in their central nervous system so we have a three a three-part process which is regulate educate and collaborate so the first step with any family is regulation and helping them understand what that feels like in their body is really important. I notice first and foremost, what is happening in my body? Maybe my stomach gets upset. Maybe my heart starts to flutter. Maybe I start to flush. Maybe I start to shake. That's kind of my thing. What are we feeling in our body? Now, some people have never settled themselves down enough to feel this. And so when you work with a, with a family member, you can um, ask them what they generally do, you know, to help calm themselves, right? Maybe it's breathing exercises. Maybe it's just some um, extrinsic movement, right? So when I'm feeling in my body what I'm feeling, I can start to name that, oh, you know, I'm shaking. I'm like so upset about what this person just said to me that I'm getting a little shaky. And I know in that moment that I cannot respond to anybody in any way. Like, I, I, I can't tell you how many times I have written a response email and then not sent it and deleted it, right? 
what I can't do in that moment is make a rational decision because I'm not in my prefrontal cortex. So how do we get back into that wise mind is to become emotionally regulated. So working with a family member is different with, than working with a peer in many ways, but I, as a peer support specialist for that family member, is going to help them understand what this feels like in my body and what are their strategies, because this is a person-centered approach for getting emotionally regulated. And, and sometimes the first step is just a pause. So what I'll tell a family member is, okay, when you get a text message from your loved one that you are feeling in your body activated, just stop and, and text me, right? Or have a safe person that you can go to and, and phone a friend. You know that, <laughs> remember that game show where you're like, I'm gonna phone a friend, right? I'm gonna pause and I'm gonna strategize. So this is where actionable solutions come in. We can't always help that we're experiencing trauma, but we can decide how to respond to that trauma or we can get back into our prefrontal cortex to regulate. So that is step number one, right? And, and, and you know, thinking in terms of family members would say, well, I don't have trauma, but helping them really recognize those family patterns and how they're reacting to certain things can be really helpful. And looking at those underlying reasons, I, again, mentioning um, uh, mending broken hearts. When certain things happen in my family, so my mom um, was sober for 40 years, completely abstinent, and then she decided she would have start drinking again. Um, and admittedly, it hasn't gotten out of control. She's 84. Uh, I'm like, you know, okay, she's 84. She has a drink, a glass with wine. I was completely activated when she was drinking that wine. And it wasn't because of her behaviors. It was because of the generational trauma around her drinking, right? So looking at like, what, what is the underlying root of that trauma and not diagnosing it by helping them recognize it. We might do a genogram with them. Um, we might look at maybe they have extreme anxiety and helping them move towards getting their own mental health help. So second pillar of recovery, what is that? It is home and health. So when a family member is uh, really struggling with anxiety, depression, um, uh, the responses from trauma, that is not in our wheelhouse, that is not in our scope of practice, we're gonna refer that out to a mental health clinician. And that's my role coming alongside someone is, you know, I can kind of practically help you get back in your um, place of mindfulness. And at the same time, I am not a trauma therapist. What I would recommend is that you look at getting some clinical help to help you work through that trauma. So I'm gonna, you know, part of uh, a family member getting regulated or becoming healthy is their own help, right? And then in that trauma, we might look at what are their shame statements. So oftentimes when someone has had trauma for a really long time, they start to feel like they are inherently bad, right? And this is part of regulation is um, families also live in a place of great shame. Um, I would, I, I was at a, my book club last night and one of the moms and she's my dearest friend has five kids and they all are in their own stage of very, very difficult um, stuff. Okay. Like really hard stuff, not all substance use, but some mental health stuff, just some, you know, the kids don't get along. And she literally was sobbing. Like I held her in my lap for 10 minutes as she wept and expressed to me, and I'm, I'm going to get emotional, that she felt inherently bad as a mother because her kids 
we're struggling. And, and, and um, one of the ways that we can help family members move back into sort of a place of um, wise mindedness is, is not trying to, to, you know, just fix that, but letting them feel that. And then talking about, you know, of course, and like, those are shame statements. You are not inherently bad. And how do we reframe those shame statements? And that's a beautiful piece of the work that I do sometimes is just, you know, I hear you say, and it's in our curriculum, you know, that I am a bad mother because my son struggles. And that's a shame statement. And so thinking about how is this shame impacting your relationship? Um, and, and how can we reframe that shame statement? So from an actionable solutions piece of this, it might, and there's a worksheet in there that you can do, but that shame statement might look like, I am a bad mom. And reframing that shame statement may look like, and, you know, in this situation, I have made choices to the best of my ability, not always perfectly, but, but uh, with what I knew I did the best that I could. That would be a way that we can reframe those shame statements. Um, and so just really, I, I find that shame is such a strong um, factor in how parents get help and stay healthy because, and you know, I, I lost my son. I understand that shame. <clears throat> I was working in the field when my son died. There was a huge shame statement attached to that. Why could I have not saved him? I can help other people. I, I couldn't save my son. And a, a great part of the work that I had to do was reframing that, right? Which is we, we did come alongside of him and we did love him well and we did do the best that we could. And, and still, you know, other people ha have choices that they make around that. So working through shame. Um, and again, uh, at a surface level, and then recognizing that if someone is really deep into shame, that they need clinical help. Um, practicing this in our uh, group environment is really, really, really powerful. So in your worksheets, there is a reframing shame exercise. And thinking in terms of what are some of the shame statements that you have in your own life that you recognize might be holding you back? Um, from really being a safe person because that's that's the work of regulation is becoming a safe person for other people yeah. how do i show up as a safe person the only way i can do that is if i'm doing my work okay and so moving through my own trauma moving through my own shame understanding activation and um, staying regulated, those are the first steps in working with a family. And then, of course, through all of this, understanding the practices of self-compassion, um, which is, is also a practice in mitigating shame, right? Uh, we can fall into, you know, terminal uniqueness, terminal helplessness, um, I will never get out of this situation. I can never get better. Um, I will never be a good mom. Our family will never get well. And those are shame messages. And, you know, practicing this idea of self-compassion, which is, you know, I am human. And that's a way that we reframe shame statements as well. This is not a linear journey. I am not going to be perfect. Um, one of the, the hardest things, if any of you guys have done any cognitive behavioral work or, you know, helped uh, dialectical behavioral work, is sometimes this work can become sort of a checkbox. If I do this, my family will get better. If I do this, my family will get better. If I do this, you know, and we have a checkbox. 
In fact, I had a checkbox for parenting that I thought if we did these certain things that, you know, we would produce great kids. One plus one always equals two. And one plus one doesn't always equal two. And so really reminding our families that we're working with that this isn't a linear journey, that we're not going to be perfect, we're not going to do things perfectly, that when we uh, adopt certain practices, that they are, um, that they uh, can be helpful, they may not be for everyone, if it doesn't work, then we're going to, um, you know, try things that might work better. Um, for most of the families I work with, giving up isn't really an option, but we can <laughs> do this in a way that really does acknowledge that um, it's okay to not be okay. One of the things that I've learned through my journey with my son's death, my daughter, you know, her brain cancer is, is uh, incurable. Um, you know, a mother that has dementia that I have to make my world small. And what does that look like? You know, and so giving family members permission um, to step out at times, to step back at times when your rest, when your tired rest, don't quit. And so this practice of self-compassion is so, so critical. And then how do we begin to heal? And so why does this all matter? Why did I start with this? You know, I, I can imagine that uh, 40 of you got on this call thinking, I'm going to walk away today with some actionable solutions. And you will, if you come back, please come back <laughs> to week two and week three. But this all matters because I can't start to make changes in my life until I understand the why behind some of my behaviors. And what happens is, is if I start to see myself as human, then I can start to see other people as human beings as well. And so when I begin to acknowledge my humanity and I acknowledge the fact that I, um, you know, also have uh, things that I need to work on um, and that I need to grow in, that then I can become compassionate, right? The, the greatest way that I have learned empathy in my life is through my own pain and my own experiences. So um, I love this quote from Caroline Miss about um, Mize about connection, right? That, you know, when we look at our own wounds and how the power of our own wounds can help us connect and show up safe for other people, then that becomes um, the way that we build relationship with others. Um, so how do we begin to heal? And I only have a couple of more minutes today, but I'm going to end with this part of our work, um, which is when we understand that our behaviors make sense, we can understand that our loved one's behaviors make sense too. So um, not pathologizing substance use or mental health behaviors, but thinking about why, why is my loved one doing this? Because of course we think this doesn't make any sense at all, right? This is crazy. This doesn't, this is, you know, and, and, and so understanding the why behind the substance use can really help us understand uh, with a, a heart of empathy and compassion. And I love this quote, they, they speak of my drinking, but they never speak of my thirst. So for family members coming in, they, they often think that the problem is the substances. If they just stop drinking or if they just stop using that, you know, our lives will get better. And the truth is, there's an underlying issue, an underlying pain point 
that has allowed the substances to work in their lives in the first place. Just like in my life, you know, yelling worked for me in the short term, ruined relationships in the long term, or fractured them, I should say. And it's taken years to repair that. So in the work that we do, you know, we will label these behaviors as selfish, as um, morally uh, failing, as personal attacks, and helping a family self-differentiate that this isn't about you, um, but it really is about stopping that pain. When I feel lonely, when I feel agitated, when I feel anxious, when I feel like I can't get anything done, when I'm bored, um, I can smoke that marijuana. I can take that pill. I can use that opioid. I can use that Xanax. And in the short term, it absolutely makes me feel better. And that is human behavior. If I... Uh, if I feel bored and I can go to the cupboard and eat a bar of chocolate and feel better, my brain's going to remember that. So my brain remembers the reward in the short term and it creates these neural pathways around that dopamine rush and that good feeling. So, you know, we know that that substance use uh, activates the limbic cir circuits, produces dopamine, and so our brain repeats that pattern. Um, and so there is a worksheet in your uh, packet today. What's behind the why? Why do you? Why does your loved one use substances? And understanding that their behaviors do make sense. Right. And acknowledging that they are getting something from that. And then I think also validating and acknowledging that we all have those same behaviors. The difference is mine just don't uh, look as problematic. Right. They might be for me internally. So with that, we're going to close up for today. Um, there might be a quick question. Um, and there's some, there's some, um, thank you for sharing some of you who have shared some statements in here uh, about their shame, about control, about our behaviors. I, I thank you for what um, vulnerability you're showing here today. And we'll have a little bit of time at the beginning of next week to kind of talk a little bit more about that as well. So go out today, look at those worksheets. If you have the opportunity to do some of that homework, do some of that homework, bring it back next week and we'll have a little bit more time on the front end to just kind of process through that or get some questions if y'all have questions. And with that, I'm gonna um, stop my screen share and send it back over to Lauren. Thank you so much, Pam. I wanna, all of those good thanks that you just gave to everyone, I wanna send them back your way as well. And thank you for, sharing both your professional and personal expertise. Um, and really quick, before we let y'all go, we're just gonna go over a couple closing slides. If I can get it going. Okay, we really hope that you enjoyed today's virtual learning event. I know I did. Um, please provide our presenter, our host organization, and the technical center with your feedback on this event by um, connecting on the QR code on the screen or using a link that will drop in the chat after I'm finished with these slides. Um, the recording slides and appropriate resources will be made available uh, approximately seven days from the end of the series, the three-part series that will be occurring. Um, and you'll get an email with the links to all that content uh, through the Great Lakes Road RC website that was mentioned earlier as well. And then once all the content is available to share, we will send out certificates of attendance for the three-part series to our participants using the information that you use to register for the virtual sessions. And if you don't receive a certificate um, within 14 days, please let the Technical Center know via the email address and we'll drop the survey link in the chat. 
Again, we encourage everyone to check out the Great Lake Rota RC's products. Um, there's our email, website, newsletter, Facebook, um, and then our technical assistance form. We'll drop all that content in the chat. And then finally, other than the next two sessions of, of this event that we sincerely hope you come back for, we'd also like to plug our upcoming events, the harm reduction gap, implications for public health and medical providers, and building impactful programs using the logic model framework for program design and outcome measurement. If you missed a previous webinar, check out our virtual library on our webpage entitled Events Past But Not for Forgotten, and we will drop that link in the chat as well. But that is all we have for you. We want to thank you again so much for attending today, uh, and we hope to see you again at our next session. Can you stop record? <laughs>